Florida education isn't as bad as we thought it was. It's actually worse. I was lying. It's so much worse. Florida just approved Prager U kids right wing propaganda videos for use in public school classrooms. I have never had that vision of God. My, and my vision is correct. And I know that almost sounds arrogant because, you know, different people have different visions of God and they're all legit, you might say, but that's not true. And as someone with a background in education and more than a passing interest in PragerU, parents have been frustrated. Teachers have been frustrated. We have seen that our schools have been hijacked by the left. It's just unbelievably insane in a completely obvious way. They're using Galileo as a political cudgel against vaccine science, and it simply makes no sense at all. I decided to look into the educational materials that they have available, and what I found was genuinely really surprising. That nuance <laughs> is not a side that they'll acknowledge. If all you focus on is low-level skills, your lessons are going to be boring. Genocide? Your ceiling plan was right, and all your doubters were wrong. Well, they were wrong. My crew and I were going to die, because after 10 weeks of sailing west, only some of them die. <laughs> Bro, they are so unhinged. War on Christmas. Of course it's a war on Christmas. Or more precisely, a war on the religious nature of America. In what way does that lead students to understanding the concept of liberty, or identifying why people immigrate to America, or appreciating America's dedication to freedom? But I don't celebrate. I don't celebrate men who transition to women or women who transition to men. Uh, I, I accept the fact that they wish to do so. I understand that. I will treat them as, as another creature. Mm. Wow. Today, I am taking my daughter Braylon Emily off to her first day of school at Prager University. Now that I'm a boss babe, I can afford to send my girl boss daughter to the top school in the country, Prager U, founded by right wing radio host Dennis Prager. I'm gonna go drop Braylon off at school and you guys can see what she's learning today. I'm Dennis Prager. What's the difference between a liberal? and a leftist. Capitalism is the only way to lift great numbers of people out of poverty. But that all changed a few years ago when left-wing writers took over the comic strip and had Superman renounce his American citizenship to be a citizen of the world. The left is leading the first widespread suppression of free speech in modern American history. I'm Dennis Prager. I really hope that she's doing well in class, sparking lots of class discussions. I've heard that Professor Dennis Prager is the best teacher around. Get you some nuts. Yeah, you effin. Up yours, woke moralist. We'll see who cancels who. What's up, my fellow small business supporters? I'm Savvy. Welcome back to Savvy Writes Books, the channel where we talk about books and business, where today we are going to be reviewing some educational materials from one particular business, Prager University, the home of Dennis Prager. But before we get too deep into it, please don't forget to subscribe because I put out these types of videos pretty much every week. And while you're at it, don't forget to ring the little notification bell. Today's video does not have a sponsor, but it was brought to you by my Patreon supporters. Check Check out my Patreon supporters whose names are up on the screen, and if you look in the description below, I've linked Patreon supporters who contribute $5 a month and up. You can go check out their stuff as well. And if you're interested at getting more behind the scenes looks at everything, if you're interested in seeing that side of things more or having your name up on the screen, you can check out my Patreon page as well. So PragerU, which is a Daily Wire-esque media company named after conservative radio host Dennis Prager, has decided to start releasing content for kids. And indoctrinating them into a lifelong hell of death and indecision. Recently, they launched PragerU Kids, which, according to their website, has one purpose, and that is to fight against the left. Because we know that sports rivalry informed views of the political landscape, a worldview informed only on black and white thinking, is clearly the best way to teach kids how to expand their horizons. As the website says, What has happened to American schools and children's entertainment? Woke agendas are infiltrating classrooms, culture, and social media. Is there anywhere that's still safe for our children? Yes, 
It's called PragerU Kids. With kids shows that teach classic American values, we offer content that parents trust and children love. PragerU Kids is the leading network with educational, entertaining, pro-American kids shows for every grade. What I can't find on any of these pages is who was involved in the development of these episodes and these resources, where those people who developed them got their teaching credentials, what those people studied, and why their educational materials and lesson plans are in any way more qualified than the ones developed by leftists with a woke agenda. Regardless, PragerU is now approved to be taught in public schools in two states, and they're exactly the two states you'd expect, Texas and Florida. You know, Florida, the state where Ron DeSantis made it illegal to ever even hint at the possibility of a student having two parents of the same gender in a classroom because that would be indoctrination. You can watch my entire hour-long deep dive video on that. But I guess it's not indoctrination to show kids videos about topics like, hold on, checking my notes, why the US has better health care than Canada, why hashtag back the blue is a superior movement for Mexican immigrants to join, why slavery wasn't as bad as we remember, and much, much more. If you don't believe me, we are actually going to break down videos with these very topics. As the PragerU website says, we are proud to announce that PragerU's supplementary educational resources are on the approved vendor list in the state of Texas. Children in thousands of K-12 Texas schools now have the opportunity to learn from PragerU's wholesome, patriotic, and age-appropriate content. Sign the petition to allow PragerU in schools across America. In an effort to give a voice to millions of Americans who want PragerU in schools, we launched a petition for teachers, parents, and the American people to show their overwhelming support to allow PragerU in classrooms nationwide. Did did you know PragerU is a state-approved education vendor? Florida was the first states. Nice typo, PragerU. Florida was the first states. I thought Florida was only one state. Anyway, Florida was the first states to officially approve PragerU's supplemental resources, and we're in the process with more states to be announced soon. Content you can trust to be engaging for students and educationally sound is now made easy for teachers to access and implement in their K-12 classes. PragerU Kids' free lesson plans are developed to cover multiple educational standards in one lesson that is fun, interactive, and entertaining. We will see if it is actually fun, interactive, and entertaining. Take, take bets on whether you think that's true or not. Finally, teachers can implement content grounded in traditional American values that inspire self-reliance, patriotism, and resiliency while teaching foundational knowledge in subjects ranging from civics to financial literacy. Wait, guys, hold on. Did I say that PragerU was approved in two states? Well, silly me writing a script for a video before I actually went to sit down and film it. Guess what the Oklahoman just posted while I was in the process of writing this very script? Ryan Walters announces partnership between Oklahoma schools and PragerU kids. Oklahoma State School Superintendent Ryan Walters on Tuesday announced a partnership with conservative nonprofit that produces videos for school children meant to counter what it calls the, quote, dominant left-wing ideology in culture, media, and education. In a video posted on the company's website, Walter said he could not be more excited to get this content in our classrooms, to get this understanding of American history without any indoctrination, but actually the facts of what happened, so the kids can know the principles the country was founded on. We'll see if that's true. So now Prager Youth materials are approved to be taught in three states. Florida, Texas, and Oklahoma. And with my luck, there will be even more states approved by the time this video comes out. Wow, with so many state education departments adopting this program, it must be extremely educational, right? Well, there's only one way to find out. Let's dive in. A first look at the titles and thumbnails of the PragerU Kids YouTube channel makes it look pretty all right. Some videos are about financial literacy, learning about things like taxes, having a few videos about international topics so that we can learn what's going on outside the US, things like that. So let's take a look at a couple of these videos and see what kind of educational content we're in for. The side against Columbus says he was a really mean guy who spread slavery, disease, and violence to people who would have been better off if he'd never gone to the New World. Uh, this is true. Columbus did enslave people, and he did commit SA against a lot of women. The part of this statement that makes argument along with it impossible is that it says people would have been better off if Columbus had never gone to the New World. This video wants us to kind of engage and argue with that point, but that's impossible because we can't say who would have been better off in which situations because we as humans don't have access to parallel universes. So that argument is just illogical to begin with. I can't argue that any 
anyone would have been better off or worse off with or without Columbus because every piece of history impacts everything else that happens after that in ways that we can't even imagine. Is there a world where people would have been better off without Columbus? I mean, yeah, there are probably a lot of people whose families were genocided, people whose moms were R-worded, people who themselves were R-worded, people who were enslaved, etc. There are probably a lot of those people who think, yes, the world would be better off without Columbus. But I guess theoretically someone could also present us with an alternate universe where someone worse than Columbus comes along after he would have been there in a later year or something. Like, my point is presenting what would have happened in an alternate universe is a shitty educational tool because there's no way to actually engage with that statement factually. I know, but the side for him says he was a really courageous guy who loved exploring, inspired generations, and spread Christianity and Western civilization to people who really benefited from new ways of thinking and doing things. So these two sides here aren't actually in opposition to one another. Someone can both enjoy exploring, be a subjectively brave person, and spread new ideas that some people might find beneficial, but also be a person who destroys the lives and civilizations of many other people. I also heard that Hitler was nice to animals sometimes, but of course this video isn't going to engage with that in any type of nuanced way. What do you think? Which side is right? I don't know. It seems really complicated. I really don't know why we're framing this as which side is right unless this video is intentionally trying to rope kids into an us versus them type of mindset. There is no reason why they're not both factually true. Again, the two statements presented aren't in any way mutually exclusive. Whether you find Columbus to be a net positive or net negative on the world depends on your analysis of his pros and cons and which of his actions had the greatest lasting impact. I personally think that Columbus is a horrible person who's had a net negative impact on the world because in my opinion, being brave and enjoying exploring are neutral qualities while essaying, murdering, and enslaving tons of people are horrendous qualities, unforgivable qualities in fact. But that doesn't mean that the other side is wrong factually, it means they're wrong morally. It means their moral compass is very different from what mine is and from what yours might be. But we're not going to delve into a complex discussion about moral relativism, now are we? Not on my Prager, you kids. It seems really complicated, but both sides are just giving their opinions. They're both giving their opinions on whether they think Columbus's positive or negative impacts outweighed the other. They're statements that both sides said were true. It's the impact that leads to the opinion. Isn't third or fourth grade or whatever age this is targeted at usually the age where we start to teach kids how to identify fact versus opinion? This video isn't going to do kids any favors when they're teaching kids that facts that support one resolution over another are inherently opinions by nature when it's the impact that's actually the opinion. But again, this isn't scaffolded to actually meet the needs of kids in a school. Anyway, from here, Leo and Layla use their magical time machine to go back in time and actually meet Christopher Columbus. Let's see what Columbus has to say to them. You know the land you found wasn't India, right? Really? Caramba! I suspected something was a little off. Okay, so this kid here has just fully interrupted the space-time continuum by revealing to Columbus that he was wrong about finding India. I hope when Leo and Layla go back home, we see an altered future where nobody calls indigenous people Indians in the 21st century anymore. Do you think we'll get that? Will we get a little, like, Back to the Future action? So what happened when you met the native people, who obviously discovered the land before you did? The Indians? The first people we met were great. The Taino. They were peaceful, curious, and really helpful. I could tell right away that they were highly intelligent. They even were able to quickly mimic everything we said to them. I ordered my men to treat them well. I see victim blaming on the horizon. Christopher here is about to steer our ship into manipulation station. It's been a diesel. The first group of people he met, well, they were civilized. They could pick up on his language quickly, which I guess is the only marker of having any human value. I'm not a diesel, you're a diesel. They were not like other colonized people, so you ordered your men to treat them well. We only treat people well if they meet our subjective markers of intelligence, which seem to be quite biased in your own favor. Great lesson for kids! Who'd you meet next, buddy? I'm sorry, Mr. Columbus, but I heard at school that you spoiled paradise and you brought slavery and murder to peaceful people. Leo? <laughs> sorry! It's what I read and heard at school. Caramba! Those are some accusations. The place I discovered was beautiful, but it wasn't exactly a paradise of civilization and the native people were far from peaceful. But you just said the Taino were peaceful. They pretty much are. But there are other tribes who aren't. The Taino I had met had cuts and scars and bruises all over them. I asked why, and they told me about the Caribs, who are vicious, warring cannibals. Cannibals? Like they eat people. See. So this kid is like, hey, so did you actually enslave people? And Columbus is like, 
only the people who were asking for it. Where's Jean-Luc Picard when we need him to enforce the Prime Directive? Don't screw the Prime Directive! These people's conflicts are none of your business, Christopher. Imagine a teacher in the classroom trying to connect this to like a kid's everyday life or understanding. So kids, Columbus had to intervene because the evil cannibals were fighting with the peaceful people. How might you apply this in your everyday life? Yesterday, I saw Julie about to beat up Molly on the playground, so I intervened and beat up Julie before she could beat up Molly. Oh my god, Kit! I wasn't gonna beat up Molly! Molly stole my lip gloss! I couldn't help it, Julie! World War II rations back home don't leave room for me to get any lip gloss of my own. Did any of you consider just not fighting at all? Shut up, Braylon Emily. Kit did what had to be done. This is just a great lesson for kids, it's great. Hey, all the things that are bad in the world I come from, jealousy, lying, murder, war, it all exists in the land I just found too. But in Europe we draw the line at things like eating people and human sacrifice. Well, at least the Europeans drew the line somewhere. Columbus is like, slavery, that happens everywhere, at least I don't eat people. Who made you the moral authority on whether slavery is better or worse than cannibalism? I personally think they're both inexcusable. Also, I love how the lesson here is, at least I don't eat people. Let's see how this might play out in the classroom. Professor Prager, is it true that you expelled Felicity because her parents owned slaves? No, Lucy, no. Felicity's just out sick today. The only kid we've ever expelled is Jeff. So this video was an example of PragerU's Leo and Layla series, which is one of their many shows for kids, which can now be taught in classrooms as real history. Now you might say, Savvy, this video clearly supported one opinion over another, and it is clearly pretty offensive to people who were enslaved and whose communities were harmed by Christopher Columbus and his actions, but at least it taught a little bit about history and about Columbus, I guess, even if what it taught wasn't like entirely true. But is it really pushing a hard right-wing agenda? Is it really trying to indoctrinate kids? Yes. Let's look at another one of their stories for kids. This is a little story called Mateo Backs the Blue. Over the last 150 years, Los Angeles, or LA for short, has been a beacon of growth, offering opportunity for millions of residents. But this rapid expansion of people and culture has also come with some growing pains. Before immigrating to Los Angeles, Juan and Lucy run a small general store in Mexico. They worked hard to make their business successful but cartel members began harassing Juan, demanding money for protection. The threats got so bad that Juan and Lucy decided to embark on the long and expensive process of applying for a U.S. green card. So the audience for this video theoretically is young enough to not naturally know that LA is short for Los Angeles, but they do naturally know what cartels are without any further explanation. Interesting target audience you've got there, Dennis. Would be a shame if anything happened to it. And the family was very thankful for their life in LA. So here we're already demonizing a movement. They were grateful for their life in LA until the Black Lives Matter movement came along. I wonder what this video is gonna say about that. Then, in May 2020, George Floyd, a black man who resisted arrest and was held under the knee of a police officer, died while in custody. That's, uh, one way to tell the story. One way that most people would call wrong, but one way nonetheless. Where did resisting arrest come from? Even the comment section of this video is calling them out for this. But isn't it great to teach kids that George Floyd just happened to die somehow, just randomly while in police custody? No mention of the nine minute long asphyxiation, no mention of the fact that there was no threat of violence and that the police were the ones who instigated all the physical violence in the situation. Not, none of that. Activists claimed that the police were targeting the black community and purposefully killing unarmed black men. As the false claims of racial targeting spread, so did the anger and violence. So once again, the purpose of PragerU Kids videos are supposedly to stop indoctrination in schools, to keep the left from presenting their biased version of US history to kids. Yet in this video, it straight up says without any proof that the claims of racial targeting were false and it characterizes only the protests as violent, not the police. That's not biased though. It's not biased when you do it. Right, Dennis? Also, why is it too mature to tell kids that gay people exist, but it's totally okay to talk to them in depth about violence? Politicians, activists, celebrities, and even major corporations began to demand reform or complete abolition of the police force. Mateo wondered, 
Who would keep his neighborhood safe if there were less police? See that really tricky, manipulative little rhetorical decision right there? We're gonna break it down. So this video claims that people started calling for police reform and in some cases abolition. Most people were calling for the police to be defunded, which this video doesn't mention, but defunded doesn't mean the same thing as abolished. It means that many police departments are overfunded and if we could use some of that budget to instead invest in community resources instead, then there would be less need for police to handle situations that could be handled by social workers, for example or could be prevented altogether. But this video doesn't talk about that. Instead, it claims that people wanted to reform or abolish the police, that's one side, and then it focuses all of that solely on abolition, as if it didn't just bring up reform also a second ago. Now, plenty of people are saying that the police do need to be abolished in time, but often this is a process involving defunding first, then investing in communities, then working towards eliminating the police over time. Yet this video doesn't acknowledge that possibility. It only acknowledges Mateo's fear that suddenly, instantly in the snap of our fingers we'll have no police unless we leave everything exactly the way it is. There are no other options. There are only two genders and those two genders are full on police force exactly as it is with no changes allowed ever or no police ever again starting right now, police are all instantly eliminated. There's no other option. Also, this video doesn't even acknowledge all the times that the police fail to keep people safe. Like when, you know, they stand by while gun violence is happening in schools. We just are supposed to take for granted that the police always keep us safe in all situations. Okay. So this video is operating under one specific premise and that's that the police always keep us safe. And if we change anything at all, there is no other way whatsoever ever for any of us to be safe. This is the way. The fact that this video started off by talking about a case of police brutality in which the police didn't keep anyone safe and no violent crime was happening in the first place. And in fact, the police caused the violence in that situation. That's never addressed. That doesn't matter. We're supposed to forget about that situation and move on. But it's not biased, guys. It's not indoctrination. Not when Dennis does it. Imagine showing this to a kid in your class and one kid raises their hand like, hey, question, the video says that without police we can't be safe, but the first example it shows of police involves the police killing someone, so isn't it true that we're not entirely safe with police either? Do you think the video includes any information on how teachers might approach that question? Do ya? Do ya? The only cop that Mateo knows personally is his middle school's resource officer, Officer Suarez. Tall and smiling, Officer Suarez has a high five, a handshake, or a fist bump for each student as he walks down the hallway. Mateo quickly discovered that Officer Suarez is, like him, a fan of LA's professional baseball team, the Dodgers. When Mateo revealed that he enjoys playing baseball too, the resource officer remarked that someday he'd hope to see him on deck to bat with the Blue Crew at Dodger Stadium, which made him smile. Officer Suarez takes time to be friendly, but also has an important job to do. So Officer Suarez is a nice, chill dude. And because of that, Mateo knows that cops in general are nice, chill dudes. But when Officer Derek Chauvin is a murderer, that doesn't mean that cops in general are murderers. Officer Chauvin gets to be one bad apple, but Officer Suarez isn't just one good apple. Officer Suarez is indicative of all cops, and we know this because a middle schooler isn't afraid of him. The tokenism fallacy only applies when it's to people we like, got it. Mateo has heard his parents talking about the news and he agrees with them. They believe that improving police tactics would be beneficial, but they don't want to eliminate the police in their schools or in their communities. Wait, so Mateo does think the police need to be reformed, but earlier in the video you characterized reform and abolition as both one thing that's part of the leftist agenda. And if Mateo agrees that there are issues with the police, then why did this video need to falsely characterize George Floyd's death earlier? Does Mateo back the blue or does he agree with the so-called rioters that the police have serious issues? It's like this video is trying to give Mateo a nuanced worldview, but PragerU itself is just so unfamiliar with the concept of nuance that it has no idea how to execute that and instead Instead, the video is just a mess. Also, this video sucks as an educational resource. Like, who is this for? Why create a fictional child with a fictional chill dude cop at school? Why not tell a real child story? Why not educate students about the police using facts about how the police force began, teaching history, having an honest discussion about the serious issues with policing, but also engaging a discussion using real world examples and events. This video's description says that it's targeted at middle school and high school age students. These kids are old enough to be thinking critically and engaging with real world material. This doesn't even feel like a piece of fiction. It's not entertaining and the story isn't meant to be taken as fiction. This feels more like an intentionally constructed straw man only with the benefit of being honest about the fact that it's fake. It's really unclear what this video is actually trying to say. Lately, however, adults have begun brazenly walking out with armfuls of goods, disappearing before police even have time to arrive. 
Wait, so the police don't even arrive on time to stop Mateo's parents from having their store robbed? Even within this fictionalized police always good universe, why aren't the police actually able to successfully do their jobs? The store is still getting robbed, and the police still exist, same as before. So the video is admitting that the police are ineffective against crime? When Officer Suarez asked Mateo how he felt about what he had seen on TV, Mateo admitted that he felt sorry for Mr. Floyd's family, but he couldn't understand why rioters seemed to think that destroying other people's property helped the family feel better. Once again, what? So Mateo does agree that George Floyd's death was an act of police brutality, right? But he's mad that people are destroying property. Has the video given any indication that the people robbing his parents' store are in any way connected with these protests? How are these two topics related at all? Unless the connection is that Floyd's death is causing people to want to abolish the police and Mateo seeing his parents' store get robbed makes him want the help of the police, which is why he's conflicted. But Mateo himself even admitted that the police never arrive in time to help the store from being robbed. So what does he think the police are going to do? They already exist in this universe, and they're already not helping. Again, if this is meant to be an educational resource, you have to show me what the connection is here. Officer Suarez asked Mateo what he thought the purpose of the police truly was. Mateo responded that he felt it was to protect others, like resource officers protect the students at school. To his surprise, Officer Suarez revealed that he also served the community in big and small ways that Mateo had never even realized, including making time for helpful chats with concerned kids just like him. Officer Suarez then revealed something even more surprising. To protect and serve was not only the police's job, but Mateo's as well. First, he needed to protect himself by doing the things he knew he should, like doing his best on schoolwork and keeping out of trouble. Next, he needed to serve his community by helping his neighbors. Officer Suarez even revealed that there are programs in Los Angeles and all around America, like Neighborhood Watch, which help neighbors look out for one another and connect citizens with their local police departments. So I guess the point of this video is that kids should just become vigilante cops. This is the way. Again, without any scaffolding here, that's going to just raise a whole new generation of mega Karens. And I also don't get why the fact that Officer Suarez, a fictional cop, being a cool guy, means that we're supposed to inherently trust all police, when this video also talks about Officer Chauvin, a real cop, who's committed some murder. Is one cop representative of everyone, or is it not? And if one cop is representative of everyone, then why is it the fictional one? Mateo's mind began to spin. He could protect and serve his community. During the riots, he and his father had helped board up windows. In fact, his father knew every shop owner on the street where their store was located. Maybe the adults could be block captains with the neighborhood watch. But was there even more he could do as a kid? The easiest thing he could do would be to say thank you to the police officers that worked in his neighborhood, and he started right then and there with Officer Suarez. Okay, so now Mateo boarding up the windows supposedly helps his parents' store not get robbed. So once again, within this fictional pro-police universe, the police aren't capable of stopping the store from getting robbed, but Mateo boarding up the windows is what finally does it. Isn't that an argument for community resource funding rather than having all the funding go to the police? You're proving my point! This video itself just showed us that the citizens handling situations better on their own than the police are capable of in this video itself. In fact, not a single cop has fixed a single problem during the entire course of Mateo's story. But I guess the message is that we're supposed to go up to cops and say thank you for your service like Mateo does with Officer Suarez here, and then we're supposed to continue solving our problems on our own because the cops aren't actually gonna help. I guess this video isn't meant to be taught along with like reading or critical thinking or anything like that. Finally, before we break down the lesson plans of PragerU Kids, let's look at one more PragerU Kids video. And this one is about, drum roll please, bu -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba, why public healthcare is stupid and why all healthcare should be privatized. I'm not kidding. Like many countries, Canada has a universal government run healthcare system. So I need y'all to look at what was on the screen in that clip. That was Genghis Khan showing his ID and his ID is in both English and in French, because that's a French-Canadian ID, and Genghis Khan is gonna wait in line for some good old-fashioned Canadian healthcare. This is unhinged. This means that Canadians have fewer options for treatment, and wait longer for medical care than people in other advanced countries. Instead of paying each time to see their doctor, all Canadians pay high taxes to fund the whole system. Look, I'm not here to say at all that Canada's healthcare system is perfect, or even that I know that much about the specifics of how it operates. All I'm going to say is that there are plenty of countries that don't have excruciating wait times for healthcare, and that the US's private healthcare system doesn't resolve all of these problems mentioned either. In fact, the Yale School of Public Health published a study in 2022 explaining that a plan like Medicare for All would have actually saved government money during the height of COVID. Also, what kind of schools are showing these videos? What kind of schools were they approved to be shown in? What was that? Florida public schools? Texas public schools? Who pays 
for Florida public schools. Wh whisper it in my ear, Daddy Dennis. That's right, the taxpayers! If we can acknowledge that public education is an overall social good that creates healthier, more educated members of society that benefits all of us in the long run, why can't we do the same for healthcare? We already live in a society, Dennis. This is Marcel. He lives in Toronto with his parents, Alain and Fran. Marcel is a huge hockey fan, and he loves playing online computer games. Marcel is just the biggest Canadian stereotype of all time. He loves hockey, and both of his parents have French-ass names. Does he also drink maple syrup out of the bottle? Does he ride an elk to school? Does he say A at the end of every sentence, A? Was he an extra on a double-digit season of Degrassi The Next Generation? Tell me more about Marcel the Canadian Wonder. Marcel and his family are proud Canadians. During the Olympics, Marcel hangs the maple leaf flag in his window and joins his parents to cheer on his country. What a patriotic little lad. I sure hope nothing happens to him. Marcel wonders why his dad and uncle don't talk very much. Recently, his mom explained that they started arguing after Grandpa Henri died from stomach cancer. Jacques thinks that if Henri had traveled to the United States to see a specialist and have surgery instead of waiting in Canada, he would still be alive. He thinks America's privatized healthcare system is much better than Canada's universal one. But Alain disagrees. Wait, 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 wait. Let me get this straight. No, let me get this French. So Marcel's dad, Alain, is mad that his uncle Jacques is having a disagreement with him. They're all French as fuck, but Marcel goes to Ontario High School. Why doesn't he go to Quebec High School if his family's this fucking French? And on top of that, his grandpa's name is Henri. <laughs> anyway, let's move a little bit into the healthcare discussion. So Grandpa Henri died because he had to wait too long to get a stomach cancer operation in Canada. And had he been in the US where the system is so much faster and better, he would have lived. So here's my question. Why didn't Grandpa Henri travel to the U.S. for an operation? The U.S. doesn't have public health care, right, as we've established. So if he were a U.S. citizen and needed that same operation, he still would have had to pay. Now he has the option to travel there from Canada and also pay. If his Canadian surgeon was that shit, why didn't he just set up a GoFundMe like all Americans have to do just to survive, travel to the U.S. and do his thing? Also, are you telling me that literally every stomach cancer surgeon in Canada sucks? There wasn't a single competent one in the entire country country. Now, every illness is going to have its specialists, but if the reason was that he needed to see a particular specialist, who's to say that the particular specialist he needs to see is always going to exist in the U.S.? If he'd had a different disease, maybe he would have needed to see a specialist in Europe or something. I'm just not seeing how this is an argument for U.S. healthcare specifically. Marcel isn't sure why Uncle Jacques doesn't like universal healthcare. What's wrong with a government-run system that treats everyone for free? Marcel knows his family pays a lot in taxes, but that's normal in Canada. And what's wrong with waiting weeks or months when you need to see a doctor? Yeah, I'm with Marcel on this one. In the US, we have to pay out the ass in taxes too, and we also have to wait weeks to see the doctor most of the time, and it also bankrupts a lot of people. Again, I'm not saying that Canada's system is perfect. I know it has its flaws, but this video acting like the US has an inherently superior system in every way is just stupid when pretty much every criticism it's given of Canada's system also exists here. American healthcare is privatized, which means that in most cases, people and their employers pay for it, not the government. American healthcare is very expensive, but the quality of care is among the highest in the world. Unlike Canada, the US has a higher number of specialist doctors compared to general practitioners. It also has private clinics where people can pay for treatment and enough x-ray, ultrasound, and MRI scanners to go around. Cool, so theoretical question, what if Marcel's family had been living in the US and also extremely poor? We're now in an alternate world where Marcel's family are all US citizens using what this video classifies as the better healthcare system. What if they're poor? How would Grandpa Henri pay for his surgery? Would he be willing to put Jacques and Alain in lifelong debt for it? Or is this video just going to pretend that poor people don't exist? When the doctor orders an important test, Americans don't wait for months like Canadians. They get that test right away. Dot, 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 if they can afford it. Otherwise, they don't, and they too will die, just like Grandpa Henri. Again, I'm not saying that Canada's system is perfect. I'm saying that the U.S.'s system is also extremely flawed, and this video is just going to pretend that those flaws don't exist. Ignoring blatant inaccuracies in favor of supporting your own narrative sounds a lot more like propaganda than education to me. But what do I know? I just used to be a teacher and also have had a lot of health problems. So it's not enough that these videos are indoctrinating kids with a specific ideology. The same thing they accuse the left of doing, but of course it's okay when they do it. But it's not just the videos. No, these are actually meant to be 
taught in schools. And we know that because PragerU is selling actual lesson plans for teachers to use when breaking down these videos for their students. Let's look at the lesson plans. First, I'd like to recommend a video by another YouTuber named Zoe B. She was a teacher for about five years and she does a great job breaking down how these lessons fail from an educator's perspective. I'm going to attempt to do something similar here, but I think her expertise is especially valid since she has more teaching experience than I do. I taught creative writing classes in various public and private schools throughout Chicago for about four years. And in grad school, I studied pedagogy and how to teach literature at the college level. I think a lot of people see creating kids content as a lot easier than it actually is. Just because something is made for kids doesn't mean that it can't be complex or that it shouldn't be accurate. So let's take a look at one of the lesson plans that PragerU offers for teachers. This one is called Citizenship in the United States. Like any good lesson plan, this one breaks down our learning objectives and key vocabulary and then gives a point by point breakdown of the lesson plan itself. So let's start with the learning objectives. No matter what grade level you're teaching, you need to make your learning objectives clear and measurable. This has been true for me when I was writing lesson plans for fifth graders and for college freshmen. The entire purpose of a learning objective is so the lesson can stay focused and so there's also a way to analyze whether or not those objectives were actually met at the end of the lesson. If they weren't met, then you're going to need to figure out how to improve the lesson plan so that those goals are actionable. This lesson plan's learning objectives are the following. Understand the concept of citizenship. Okay, fine. I mean, the word understand is a little vague in my opinion, like what specifically should kids be able to do? Define citizenship, use it in a sentence, place it in the context of the world around them, identify the pieces of what constitutes citizenship as a concept. Regardless, it's a fine objective. Recognize the origins of modern citizenship from ancient Greek and Roman empires. Okay, cool. So based on this objective, the lesson should draw clear connections between how citizenship looked in Greek and Roman empires and then compare and contrast how that looks within the US. The lesson itself is definitely going to do that, right? Right? Differentiate between a republic and a monarchy. Okay, in my opinion, this is the clearest of the goals so far. No notes other than to say that maybe there should be a connection to citizenship somewhere in there, like differentiate between a republic and a monarchy and identify how citizenship looks different in each setup. Assuming that's part of the lesson on citizenship and not just like some random other thing that it's also teaching us. Explore the rights and privileges of US citizens, such as, and then a long list of our rights. Uh, okay, sounds good. Recognize the responsibilities of US citizens, including obeying laws, paying taxes, etc. Okay, and finally, appreciate the significance, honor, and privileges associated with being a citizen of the United States. What does that last one mean? I will refer back to Zoe B's video here because she did an excellent job breaking down why the word appreciate doesn't have a clear learning objective. And she was actually breaking down a different lesson plan. They use appreciate as a learning objective a lot. Appreciate is not a bloom word. You will not find a Bloom's taxonomy list of verbs that contains appreciate because appreciate is not a demonstrable accessible action. In fact, I actually looked it up to make sure that I was right on this. And if you look up Bloom's taxonomy words and appreciate, you only get resources telling you to avoid using it because it's not measurable. I completely agree with her here. How can you possibly measure whether or not a student has appreciated the significance of US citizenship? I'm a 30 year old adult with a master's degree and even I don't know what that sentence means. There's no way a third grader, which is the target audience of this lesson, is going to understand that. These other objectives are much more measurable. Differentiate between a republic and a monarchy? You can measure that. Show a kid two examples of different government setups and ask them which is which. If they get it right, then you accomplish the objective. Recognize the responsibilities of US citizens. Sure, you can measure that. Hey, Billy, name three things that a US citizen has to do by law. Uh, obey laws, pay taxes, do jury duty. Good job, gold star. Even the vague goal of understand the concept of citizenship is somewhat measurable. You can ask the kid to write a sentence using the word citizenship in it or give them a list of qualities that a person might have and ask if those particular qualities constitute citizenship. How can you measure, appreciate the significance, honor, and privileges associated with being a citizen of the US? How? Especially because appreciation means different things to different people. It's a subjective emotional term like love or hate. Anyway, that makes no sense, but at least some of these goals are okay, right? Well, let's see if the lesson accomplishes them. The first part of the lesson is a warm up where you ask students what they already know about citizenship. And I think this is a decent warm up. When I teach a poetry workshop back in the day, I'd usually start by asking kids, what do you know about poetry? And write their answers up on the board in fun colors. It would get them centered on the main topic of the day. It would help me as the teacher know what gaps I might have to 
to fill in during the lesson and what areas of knowledge to take as a given. So that's fine. Then according to the lesson plan after that I'm supposed to hand them a copy of this worksheet. And then as a whole class as a group we're supposed to attempt to answer the questions. Okay I mean a worksheet seems a little redundant when we're just warming up and we already asked what they know but I guess the questions on the worksheet can guide the discussion. Now let's move into the main part of the lesson which includes watching a PragerU Kids video about citizenship. The video is 12 minutes long which in my opinion is too long for third graders to watch all at once. I've taught kids that age they need to be up and moving. That age group has energy like you've never seen before. Thankfully we're gonna play a game right? I mean the lesson plan says right there that I as the teacher am supposed to say verbatim let's play a fun game and see if we got it right. See if we got what right? The definition of citizenship? E either way there's a game coming right? Right? No. Instead, we're going to watch a video of other people playing a game. Let's take a look at the video. This video starts off with a guy dressed as Uncle Sam rapping. You to the end to the C-L-E, you bet it's me, it's Uncle Sam! Uh, the 90s called, they want to bully you. Here are the rules. There are a total of eight questions. Each correct answer is worth $5. But the final question is worth $20. If someone is stuck on a question, they can pay Uncle Sam $2 for a clue, or they can pay him $5 to ask help from a friend or a parent. Now, once someone answers incorrectly, that is it. They are eliminated. However, the good news is they get to keep all the cash that they earned up to that point. So we're watching a game where the contestants can win cash, which is a great incentive. Obviously, the teacher doesn't have cash to hand out, though. And if I'm supposed to bring in cash, the what you'll need section of the plan doesn't specify that I'm supposed to bring cash into the classroom. So isn't this video just going to make kids jealous that they're not the ones winning cash and they have to watch other people win cash, even though they have to answer the same questions, but for free? instead. Well, you make a good point. Also, here's my next question. Why doesn't the lesson plan give us a way to adapt this game for the classroom? Back when I was in elementary school, we played games all the time where you could win like M&Ms or like a cool neon eraser or something like that. Why doesn't the lesson plan break down ways to play the game with your students with potential like inexpensive prizes they could win? Or if the school doesn't have the budget for additional prizes, maybe the kids could win like class cash or something. And the lesson plan could then include like a page of printable class cash that the teacher Teacher could hand out and then if the class collectively wins enough cash from the game together that you could work towards like a pizza party or something or you could let the kids spend the class cash on incentives like a free ice cream bar in the cafeteria or maybe an extra recess for something that doesn't cost anything at all I'm just spitballing here I'm coming up with all these ideas right now so let's get started with question number one question one citizenship describes the relationship between an individual and the blank he or she lives in a planet B, house, or C, country? C, country. Bingo! Okay, so we're starting off easy, and then the questions are going to get more difficult. Looks like we are understanding the concept of citizenship. That's good. Uh, C, country. Correct, Woo! Amanda. Correct. A, planet. B, house. Or C, country. Country. Boom! <laughs> <laughs> five. Blake is already on fire. C, country. Woo! You are correct. correct. First five First dollars, five dollars. Alan. Woo! Country. See. She's saying there's $5 in her hand. Country. First five. So instead of playing the games of class, we're going to watch other people on TV just give us the answers. Why? Prager, you already had to construct the rules of this game so that the people in the video could play it. Why doesn't the lesson plan outline the ways that the kids could play the game in the moment? Back when I taught creative writing, I used to use games all the time as a way to get kids, especially kids in this age group, which is roughly third grade, to get them motivated and engaged with the material. And you can use active games in conjunction with videos. In a poetry workshop, for example, I'd show kids like a two minute video of someone performing a poem and then I'd hand out Shel Silverstein poems and then those kids could perform them together as a group, getting up and moving, acting them out, using their hands, things like that. Sometimes we play a game involving each kid like saying a line from a poem in a goofy voice. The more you can get kids at that age standing up, moving around, talking out loud, the easier of a time you're going to have. They want to do those things anyway. Question four. Which of these is not a right guaranteed to citizens by the U.S. Constitution? A. The right to vote. B. The ability to run for office. Or C. An affordable home ability to run for office. Ooh, that would be incorrect. incorrect. She's standing she, it out. She's, she, standing, she's it standing it out. It. She's ready. <laughs> A, the right to vote. B, the ability to run for office. Or C, an affordable home. C, an affordable home. She hesitated, Ooh, but she got it right. She's got she it. She got it right. She got it really? correct. I don't have a right to an affordable home. Unfortunately not, Uncle But I'm going to need it. She's taking all my money. 
I think it's kind of funny that this lesson is like, nope, you are not guaranteed affordable housing as part of the United States, and Uncle Sam is visibly sad about it. Uncle Sam represents the whole woke leftist affordable housing agenda. But yeah, no. do you know them all? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Do you know the capital? Right now. Yeah, there on you the go. Spot. Go. Oh. No, I can't. No, go. Go. Alabama, Arkansas, Minnesota. <laughs> Let's go! I love how she gets the words to the 50 Nifty United States song wrong. Who sings it like that where she's like, Alabama, Arkansas, Arizona, Minnesota, whatever she said. <laughs> Alabama, Arkansas. <laughs> Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, California, Colorado, Connecticut. You guys know that song, right? Anyway, I'd like to point out that the questions they're asking and answering here are exactly the same ones on the worksheet. According to the lesson plan, we were supposed to do this worksheet together as a class like 20 minutes ago. So not only are the kids not playing the game, they're watching other people answer questions that they already answered on paper sitting down at their desk. This is so boring I could cry. PragerU Kids is devoted to teaching what most schools aren't. PragerU, teaching you that school can be neither fun nor interesting. It has to be boring even when there are games involved. Then the lesson plan tells us that this will end with a 10 minute warm up, which has time for the students to complete the worksheet independently. The worksheet that we did at the beginning of class, the worksheet that had the same questions on it that we watched in the video. They're doing the same questions for a third time in a row. Why? So they memorized them? Was that what the real learning objective was? Memorize the worksheet? So did this lesson accomplish the learning objectives? Well, it did define citizenship, so sure. Did it explain to us how modern citizenship descended from the Greek and Roman empires? No. This lesson taught us nothing about ancient Greece or Rome, nothing about how citizenship looked in those societies, nothing about how that is similar to or different from the citizenship we see in the United States. All it told us was that Greece and Rome also existed and also had citizenship as a concept. Cool. And? Did we learn the difference between a republic and a monarchy? I guess sort of. We learned that they have different definitions, but we didn't see any examples of monarchies. We didn't see how that actually plays out. We were just told monarchies have one ruler and republics vote on multiple rulers. Cool. What does that look like? What are some examples of countries who've had each setup throughout history? Why spend time talking about them when we could instead fill out the same worksheet three times in a row? So now let's take this a step further. Let's get a little meta here. What are the learning objectives of PragerU as a whole and does PragerU kids accomplish them. Well, from what we saw before, PragerU's objectives are 1. End indoctrination in schools and 2. Teach kids pro-America values. Did they accomplish this? First, did PragerU end indoctrination in schools? Well, let's review the video topics. We watched a video about healthcare. Did that video explore the different models of healthcare, define and break down how different systems work, and encourage students to examine the pros and cons of each? No. The video just told us that the U.S. has a better system than Canada and that public systems are always worse and we just need to trust that. What about the policing video? Did that video give us an overview of the history of policing, show us in what ways police forces have evolved throughout the decades, and engage them in a discussion about the pros and cons of the current state of policing? No, it just told us that the police are always good. And how about the Columbus video? That video even started off by presenting two different sides to the argument. There's no way that that video could be indoctrinating people, right? That video must have done things like show students the short-term and long-term effects of Columbus's voyages, read different perspectives on what various groups of people found the pros and cons to be, and then ended with students synthesizing the material into their own conclusion, like through a class discussion or an essay of some sort. Right? No! It just told us that Columbus was good because at least he didn't eat people. So I'd say PragerU does not accomplish their goal of ending indoctrination because these videos, by presenting a biased viewpoint, exist solely to indoctrinate kids. Maybe they just mean end indoctrination by anyone other than me, only I'm allowed to do it. Now let's look at the second learning objective. Do these videos teach kids pro-America values? No, they don't teach kids anything because all they get kids to do is memorize a worksheet without drawing any connections to the real world whatsoever and most kids probably won't even be awake for the lesson because it's so goddamn boring. So PragerU has failed to accomplish all of its learning objectives, which can only mean one thing, and that is that I am pulling my daughter out of Prager University. 
Braylon is instead going to Woke Gay Agenda Academy, unless I can find her a better boss babe school first, of course, but we'll have to see how that plays out. Tell me your thoughts on PragerU kids in the comments below. I am absolutely shocked that this material is considered suitable for public schools, and I honestly think that we as Americans owe our students a whole lot more than this type of content. But I'm interested to hear all of your guys' thoughts as well, so feel free to leave a comment below. I will see you guys again next week. Maybe Braylon Emily will be there too, and we can hear about how her new school's going. But in the meantime, please keep on supporting small businesses and have a fantastic day. Bye! Get you some nuts! Yeah, you effin'. Up yours, woke moralist. We'll see who cancels who.